and you don't want to draw power from the battery when the vehicle's resting because you'll drain the battery and it won't go to start. You won't have sufficient um, capacity when you're ready to drive off because you will have drained it through the system in the form of lights and other appliances. Hey, it's Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. We have got a customer's travel van in here and it has been equipped with solar, inverter, battery, integration between vehicle battery and microgrid battery, an HVAC mini split, complete features, interior lighting, amenities, cell booster, sump pump, water system, the full meal deal. We've got one installation and two repairs to perform today see what we can do. Three challenges today. Challenge number one that we're going to work on, um, Cliff, if you want to remove that tail light, rear right tail light, um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to pull up the panel between the seats. We're going to route a set of two conductors back to the Orion Smart and we're effectively going to combine the vehicle output power from the battery terminals to the solar and inverter battery system so that if there's not solar replenishment, the Orion Smart then becomes the, the charge controller to manage vehicle power only when the vehicle is operating, and that's where the setup step comes in, to uh, transfer the vehicle power back to the microgrid so that um, the battery system gets replenished whenever the vehicle is driving. So if you want to start with the tail light, I'll, I'll start in the front. Our wiring path is out of the battery case underneath the vehicle through a series of existing supports. We're going to diagonal at the back using some Heiko Sun Bundlers and then pop up through the tail light. There's a, there's a wiring chase there and into the Orion Smart. So that's, that's number one. Number two and three projects are the sump pump, which is located underneath the vehicle about here, and the uh, electronic ball valve. Neither of those are working and they're both operated on switches here. This is a great time to introduce Adelaide Jones. This is Adelaide's van. Hi, I'm Adelaide. This is my house. Um, yeah, I live here full time and they've set up the electric system for me. So it's my full time home on wheels. I bought it about a year ago from Enterprise. It was just a, a cargo van and this is all self converted. Um, my partner and I did all the interior work and the electric was done here. Um, yeah, it's a 2019. It was white and we painted it. And we, we cut out holes for windows, put up solar panels, we have fans here, and we also have a mini split which will operate soon and we'll have climate control. So that's really cool. Um, we have everything we need. This, this is actually the toilet, so we have a restroom. This is our sink that is full of things right now, but uh, I can obviously like shower and stuff here, but we can turn it around and have an outdoor shower. Just super nice. nice. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's why we put it there. That's um, phenomenal. At one point, we had a drain uh, right there, so we were going to be able to use this as the, the shower floor. Um, that does not work, even though you might see other van lifers do that. So, we made a different choice, and now we have some vinyl that is waterproof down here, and it looks really great. It does. Um, I love the pattern. Yeah. So, we have our sink. There's just some storage down here. This is a full oven, and this way I'm redoing the countertop, but this can be removed and then put over here so I have even more counter space um, while I cook. Runs on propane. Propane's back here. We're still working on getting that fully installed. More storage down here. We have our little fridge. Slides out. It is DC, so it doesn't take up a lot of power, which is pretty cool. Um, some outlets up here. We also have an outlet box hidden up there because we do have a Simply Safe security system and that requires a lot of plug-ins, so that's why that's up there. Yeah. Um, you know, storage and all of these. These two are food, those two are clothes. And I travel with my partner, dog, and two cats. So the dog space, yeah. Nice. The, the dog is a 70 pound lab. He's not small. Wow. Um, but it's been fine. We were just in Seattle for three months and had no problems. And we were in Florida a month before that. And down here is where he sleeps. He spends a lot of his time. We have a lot of stuff there right now just for our purposes, but it essentially works as a bunk bed. And someday when we get everything operational, um, this will be able to lift up as well. So you can raise the bed and I'm super short so I can actually sit underneath, which is pretty cool. Um, and I said that there were cats, so obviously there's a litter box somewhere. It's not a problem at all. It's this whole thing. It 
this section is the litter box and this is just like so they um, don't track stuff I just have a pad there and there's a little hole right here that I can open and shut if I want to as well nice. so it's out of the way no problems I love it and the seats swivel around they're pretty fun and then now is this a, a the, the seat feature did that come with or did you have to do something this. yeah you have to install swivel seats okay they both have it which is pretty cool phenomenal so the vehicle itself was about 35,000 when I bought it which is really good it had 44,000 miles and like I said 2019 pretty new um, and I put probably about 20,000 into it including what I paid to Jefferson here phenomenal so whole lot cheaper than the house yeah yeah awesome when I drive the alternator and the battery bank is going to be able to charge my back battery right. so it'll build that up as I drive so I can have some more power especially moving out to Phoenix where I'm going to be very hot and have to worry about climate control with the mini split is that your next stop Phoenix yeah I'm there yeah. all next school year and you're a traveling teacher now right mm -hmm. yep I, I'm a traveling teacher. It works a lot like traveling nurses. I um, fill in for hard to fill positions all over the country. Um, it's only really for special education teachers. Um, my last assignment was in Seattle, like I said, and next I'm headed to Phoenix. And this is why we live here. We can just pick up and go to the next destination. My partner um, so cool. is also a teacher, so he just goes and substitutes in any district I work in. Nice. And it works pretty well. How do you find a place to land and park this in Phoenix? What's okay. the best? So the best option if you're staying somewhere more long term is I have found this uh, another service it's called Trusted House Sitters, and I actually am a professional house sitter now. Um, nice. I don't get paid for that, but the way it works is you pay like a $200 membership fee a year, and then when people go on vacation, I can stay at their homes, and I obviously have a safe place to park, and I basically roll up with my own little bedroom and house, and, and I'll go in to care of their pets and have that safe place, and then go to the next assignment. So that's usually the wow. best option because like, I'm staying in million dollar homes for free uh, doing that, it's, especially with my profile and background check and things. So that's really cool. That's a ton uh, of fun. Yeah. Access to the pool and yeah, hot tub. Access and access to everything. I'm about to stay somewhere that has a bunch of horses and they're like, our horse, our stall cleaner is going to um, feed them every day. Will you just go out every day and give them carrots? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Right. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. And, and when we are between sits, it's really just any legal overnight parking spot. Now, sometimes uh, there might be some ordinances that don't allow people to live in their vehicles. When that happens, you just go to a campsite or there's a, another website called Hip Camp, which people like rent out their driveways and let you stay there. But honestly, I haven't paid to park anywhere in probably a year. I, we're just, we're good at finding places. Wow, yeah. you are working the system in the most positive way to mm -hmm. just a really cool experience. Yeah. How long do you anticipate doing this? This is my this, life, man. This is it, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we say five years in the van for sure, just because of some of the warranties that we have on it. We know we're safe for five years. We're, certain, we're certainly willing to do longer. I'm learning Spanish. My partner um, speaks French. We'll probably end up going to Europe eventually um, and go that direction in a few years when I work on my PhD, so we'll see. Van life is much bigger in Europe, so I, there's also a possibility of selling this one and going overseas and, and building there instead, and because it is a little easier to build in Europe than it is here, just because of the resources and mm -hmm. honestly available vehicles. So yeah. we'll see. It really depends on the condition of everything when we cross mm -hmm. that bridge. Did you have any trouble sourcing components? Is there like a yes. one-stop shop where you no. can just get everything? <laughs> Did you feel like you got handed a plan or did you have to create from no, scratch? I, I created it from scratch. Um, I was really inspired by Lewis the Van on YouTube. They're a great, cute little couple from Indiana who nice. um, also do van life. They they will stop about every five months or so and like just bust out building five, six vans, make video content about wow. that, and then go and travel until they want more money and, and just do that. So they, they have some great content and they really helped inspire the layout, but like they, they're the ones that did the floor and like we just, you know, make adaptations. There is no perfect map. And, and as you know, there's so much coming out right now, just new technology oh, that is happening so it's quickly. A flood. And I'm so happy you have a videographer here because like what you're about to do, we know there's one video on YouTube wow. that was made like six months ago. Like this is just so new and what we're doing 
hasn't really been done before. Um, at at least some components of the van. I mean, there are a lot right. of van lifers, but there's not as many full-time van lifers. There are not as many people in there. I'm, I'm in my thirties. He's my, uh, my partner's in his forties doing this. It's usually like younger folks, um, coming into it and not like making this decision to live there full time. So, um, no, there's not a perfect roadmap to do it. And you just sort of figure it out as you go. That's neat. You know, the vans are relatively standardized. You've got mm -hmm. Nissan, Ram, Mercedes, yeah. Ford, Chevy, like mm -hmm. of just a few options and they all follow relatively the same footprint and dimensions. So it seems like at some point there could be some standardization around it, but maybe maybe part of the, the appetite is the creativity. You're expressing yeah. yourself in an extremely unique environment mm -hmm. in a completely one of a kind manner. Yeah, and it's completely adaptable. I think that's what I love about van life. You can make it anything you want. Like at my particular needs with having a partner, a dog and two cats are not everyone's needs. I have a friend right. building right now. Um she just has a small dog, so like we're conferencing with her and she's going to put cabinets on both sides because it's smaller and it makes more sense. You know, you can just really make it whatever you want to make it. So I love that. It's a ton of fun. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. I always get jazzed when you pull in here and we get to take a look at this yeah. and, and dream about what would it be like if I did that? That's so credit to Adelaide. She, she put all this together. I mean, like we physically put some of this on the roof for her, um, but she did the design, the layout. And so let me talk you through a couple components here. We these two black components are exhaust fans and Adelaide and her partner cut those in, waterproofed them. And that is to help, if I'm correct, maintain the temperature of the vehicle at a pleasant level and just circulate air. And then we obviously we've got the solar array here. Um, this is a cellular range booster. Capture the signal and broadcast it inside the vehicle. This small solar panel is a standalone Simply Safe uh, outdoor security camera. And uh, it's pretty cool. There is wiring underneath the panels. Uh, we've used AFCAT, um, that'll be in the description, to seal the penetrations through the roof. Um, it's an RV a roof sealant, uh, really robust. I think that's best in class. So uh, here it is, this is the roof. So you've been wondering what is going on with this. This is the means that the customer selected and Jerry's still out. I don't know if it's you know the best thought process or not. I, I don't have an opinion. I'm interested to hear from you, but it's a mini split and it handles climate control for the vehicle when it's boondocked and the engine isn't running. It utilizes the stored energy in the microgrid. And let me tell you what, had some challenges. You, you contact a regular HVAC contractor and they're like, nah, bro, absolutely not. We don't, we don't, this is totally other. This is something very, very different. Here's why. There have to be flexible refrigerant lines that are managed. And this is clever the way they've done it because these lines can't get pinched. They can't get kinked. If you lose your refrigerant, you're out hundreds of hundreds of dollars with a potential for environmental contamination. And so uh, they're flexible refrigerant lines. They've been mounted to the exterior of the vehicle. They're rubberized. No, they're sealant. Uh, we didn't do this. We outsourced it to an RV um, partner. And, uh, they're like a mobile repair shop kind of firm. And then they penetrated, put a grommet, and sealed that uh, wiring penetration. So uh, main power comes in here. We chose non-metallic liquid tight. Penetrates the door, slips through the door, follows the standard wiring channel here, like the rest of the wiring, up through the chase and then comes out and gets wired into the unit here. So there are the refrigerant lines. Here's the, uh, I'm gonna call it the cassette or the fan inside um, that blows the cool air or the hot air. This is capable of both heating and cooling. And uh, it's quite, quite the deal. <laughs> Let me tell you one point of controversy. Should a unit like this be equipped with a hard start kit? Secondly, is a hard start kit the same or different than a soft start kit? Here's my understanding. Whenever you have an HVAC system that is approximately equivalent or even close to being equivalent in power to your renewable energy system, your inverter and battery capacity, whatever the limiting factor is in your design, you absolutely want a hard start kit. And I think that a hard start kit and a soft start kit do the same thing. A hard start prevents a hard start and a soft start creates a soft start. So they're used interchangeably by the HVAC um, companies on the left as hard start kits. 
and soft start kits are what companies like Tesla and renewable energy companies call them. But what it does is when a motor starts up, there's inrush current, which is substantial. It could be even two or three times the, the continuous motor load. And so that inrush current is meant to be minimized so it doesn't max out the equipment trip breakers causes cause fuse to blow so the uh, hard start kit coupled with an HVA system HVAC system whenever installed on a renewable energy system I think is a phenomenal idea um, unfortunately this has gone bad the manufacturer has warrantied it out it's going to be replaced um, and that kind of stuff gets a little bit pricey for the consumer when the lines have to be discharged to recapture that refrigerant the old unit's taken down, unit, new unit is put up, and then those lines have to be reconnected and recharged, both the electrical lines and the refrigerant lines at both units. So it is, it is a pain, but hopefully this gets dialed in and is working 100% within the next couple of weeks. This is the 159 inch wheelbase Ram 2500. Pull the clips, pop this positive Terminal cover off. Adelaide, are you using any power right now if I disconnect the negative terminal to keep it safe? Just the lights by Okay, and actually I will, um, I won't be quite, I'll, I'll, I can get a lot of pre-work done to minimize that outage, come to think of it. Minimize the time it's down. Hello. Pop this right open yesterday. There it is. There it is. All right. So my wiring pathway this is kind of what it's done. The the, the battery compartment um, is exposed on the other underside, so you want to maintain the integrity and water tightness. So you can transfer wiring over the top of the battery compartment, like it's been done by the manufacturer here. We also have an opportunity right here where there are uh, the mounting holes in the battery compartment and this one is at a com particularly convenient location and it's just nearly big enough. So I'm going to enlarge it by a couple of centimeters and then that's going to be our wiring, our wiring chase to below the vehicle. There's a tight, tight spot, tight spot. Let's stick it. All right, that's what I'm looking for. All right, time to, to bounce underneath and we'll start pulling that wire. I'll tell you, I've used, selected 10 gauge PV wire. 10 gauge, because I needed 30 ampacity, 30, 30 amps of current capacity. And then PV wire, because it's sunlight, water, oil resistant, it has a very heavy jacket. Um, the, the wire is going to be exposed to all kinds of corrosive elements splashing up off the road and this wire is going to be particularly durable against those elements. So it'll, I'm, I'm confident unless it receives direct damage from you know flying rocks and, and all everything underneath the vein is subject to that same potential risk, um, it's going to endure. So wire selection is important. Um, 30 amps, 10 gauge PV wire, also known as USE2. Gotta have to have to have to wear eye protection down here underneath a vehicle. If you're not used to it, you just you have to. You'll be hating life in about five minutes. You'll be knocking rust and dirt loose into your eyeballs. Make sure it's a close fitting pair of eye protection. Let me repeat, have to have to have to. So what I'm doing is um, I'm gonna route it around I'm gonna route it around um, the spare tire, etc. But first of all, I'm just gonna make sure it's up and over everything. It's routed through the supports, and then I'm gonna come back and start tying it off and protecting it, bushing it where it passes through those supports. These wiring supports are not real stout. A couple of them have already popped, popped loose prior to this work, and so um, I'm just gonna take it real, real easy, feed it gently. Definitely helps to have somebody on the other end so you're not sliding in and out. There's a heat shield here to keep wiring off the exhaust. Real important to stay on the protected side of that heat shield. Come back to that one. 
So this is how these wiring supports work. Um, they pop open, they pop closed, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and slide this split loom over the top of it. And it's kind of a bulky, uh, Kind of a bulky fit which is good because it's going to compress in there and it'll have a better likelihood of staying in place what i'm not trying to do is is protect this wire for all eternity what i am trying to do is add years to the lifespan uh, so you just take that click that's exactly how it works and when you need to open it up you just pop a flat head in here and give it a little pry and there it is but they don't have too many cycles in them so just take it easy and be gentle there it is that's all it is. I might come back and tape that. Let me let me kind of see how these progress as I go. Put some electrical tape on that to better hold it in place because that, that's not gonna stay by itself. So tape it up, that's what we're looking for. All right, so this is 10 gauge PV wire. It's got a very heavy jacket. It's 90 degrees C rated. It's rated up to 2000 volts, way overkill. We're operating at 12 to 15. It's wet or dry, also known as RHW2, USE2. Um, direct burial, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty durable stuff, pretty durable stuff. It's well, it's like the number one wire for the solar industry. Down below, what he doesn't know is I'm about to tickle him really bad. There it is. It's going to be tough, it's tight. If you can shove the wire through that hole, it'd be phenomenal. I want the hole to be as small as possible, but if it's too small, we'll enlarge it. All right, you're right there, buddy, right there. Uh-huh. Is the um, You stay after it. Let me grab a, should have grabbed my needle nose before this. We might, oh, you're right there. Don't move, don't move. All right, there's, there's our black conductor. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, this is the harder part, getting the second conductor in there. I'm gonna try to hold on to that black one, the negative. No, not yet. Tell you what, can I see that light real quick? Right in here. Man, it sure is close though. It sure is close. All right, provide gentle upward pressure. And I'm gonna get a small flathead screwdriver. You just hold tight right there, don't let that black fall down. Small holes through any kind of um, opening like this, whether it's housing or vans, really makes it a difference. You know, you never know when you're gonna get, start, you know, attract rodents for whatever reason. You've got a cereal box sitting on the counter and you come back and, you know, if you just, just make it as hard as possible. They're gonna get in. They're gonna get into a castle, a palace, uh, the White House, but you just have to make it as hard as possible for them. And uh, hopefully they'll pick an easier target. So keeping, keeping the holes small, tight, it's, it's worth the extra effort. All right, pull it back just a shade. All right, now back up again. They're like right there, dude, we're coming through. All right, keep the gentle upward pressure. Here it comes. Boom, you did it, Zeke. All right, I'll take all the wire you have down there that's like loose. You tell me. Is there any slack hanging down? Nope. All right. A right. little bit. Red or black or both? Uh, both. Both. Gentle pressure. Tell me when. All right, I've got plenty. Good job, buddy. Okay, so one thing I'm using right here, um, I, I ditched quickly, I said it, I regret it, no electrical tape. I'm using Heiko Sun Bundlers. This is an aircraft grade stainless steel cable surrounded by a UV stabilized nylon coating. And it's incredibly durable. Like you can do pull-ups off of this as a, as a grown male. It might take two of them, but you can do it. And so the mechanism for securing around each one of my um, wire supports and bushings is um, taking this, loop it back on itself just like a zip tie. A zip, a zip tie's lifespan down here is probably, shoot, like two, two to four years. That's my opinion, humble opinion. I've been wrong once before. And um, so you just cinch it down and then take the cutting edge of your lineman's pliers 
any type of cutting plier you have and collapse it on itself. It's not going to cut through. You, you're just pinching it down and then you cut off the excess. So it's really user friendly and it's extremely durable and but you you know zip ties you might be paying 10 cents a piece these things you're paying 70 cents a piece but if they're going to do the job and you only touch it once it's the Heiko sun bundler link in the description hashtag worth it um, they could replace zip ties for a, a wide variety of applications and repairs all right so modification cliff's a smart guy he's going to take whatever plan i have and make it better so my turn to be humble <clears throat> we don't need the black because that's the negative. The entire chassis is the negative. It is the ground for a 12 volt vehicle system. And so what I've done is <laughs> the entire chassis is bringing the ground from the battery up front, the vehicle battery, to the battery system in the back. And I've just run a 10 gauge wire to bring that ground or negative back here as well. So we really only needed one conductor. <clears throat> now we've got a spare conductor. I will label it as such on both ends, cap it off, and it'll be there for a future date. If we need to remark it for something else, whether it becomes a, a pole wire, a comm, a, a positive for something else, who knows, but um, that's, that's an extra at this point. Or, or maybe the positive fails at some point, you just never know, spare, spare never hurts, but modify the plan. One conductor, that's a positive, that's red, not two. Pull that, um, I'm gonna call it a green shunt out. When you terminate it, pull that out right there. Yeah. Um, it's essentially a positive in, positive out on the ground. Um, let's see, that's pretty snug. Yeah, I can see that light. There's no getting your head in there. I can't even see what kind of terminal it is. Is it? A flathead. I'm um, okay to try to terminate that and leave it in place. Okay. Try it. If it doesn't work, then we'll the pull it out. Thing, this is not terminated. This is. That's the ground? Yeah. For what component? It's going into this. Ah. And have you found a terminal for that? That's interesting. Maybe we will use the black and since it is terminated. Oh, it's terminated on that side, or it will be? It will be, yeah. Yeah, um, let me grab a flathead stripper. I'll terminate that. If you can't find uh, a home for this, then uh, we'll pull it out and terminate the black. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, we don't, uh, actually have a real convenient ground termination back here like this one's not been connected so back to now we're on plan C it looks like we are using the black and we will terminate it since it's grounded up at the front it's the negative uh, so I've got a very tight space to work in here I can't even see the screw terminal I th think it's flathead but, yep so we've got it in a ground and an out that's positive in, positive out. Positive in comes from the vehicle battery in this case because of the function of this device. It's taking vehicle power and transferring it to the Victron energy system. And then, uh, so vehicle is in. Cliff, did you have any wire management thoughts back here? Or should I make something up? I had not thought about that. Um, do you want to grab also, a label maker? To land inside of here. It may be. Put it in with the rest of the cables then. And pop the top off. Yep, you have a flathead, or a, sorry, a, a mini. Uh, stubby, that's what I'm trying to say, stubby. You have a stubby handy anywhere? All right, you like the looks of that? As far as cable management, I'll, I'll bring it underneath here probably and tuck it right up in there. Yeah. Give just a little extra, get it further into Maybe the corner. The wires that are running down here. Take it to the floor and back up. But, I mean, I don't like it that way, but there are wires that are already running along the ground there. Not the ground. 
<laughs> multiple types of grounds taking place here. The floor. Izzy, could you grab the label maker so we can put labels on this? All right, let me, yeah, let's, let's just try that on for size. I'm gonna cut it a little bit longer here. Nope, I won't even cut it yet. Uh, the warehouse guys can tell you where it is. From the warehouse, yes sir. So we're gonna take this grounding conductor, send it through this, this bushing and make it up right there on a stake on, just like it's been done. And then we will have a spare terminal front to back. But first, we've removed this green shunt, strictly just pops right out, pulls out from the Orion Smart, that's a Victron Energy device, we've removed that. Um, and so the order of connections is important. The last connection to be made at the back is the positive out. And the last connection to be made at the front is the negative in. And effectively you're going to, um, he, he don't want sparks and, and electricity jumping around. So positive on the back end, last connection, new, negative on the front end, last connection. So that's the positive from the Victron system and we're capping it off because it is an energized system. There's, there's power, available power here. So we don't want him bumping into anything and arcing. I think um, there are two, let's see. Yeah, that'll work. There, there are two similar to this. Is this the larger of the two? Like in the same, com same bin? Yeah. Okay, so that is terminated. That's in there. I'm gonna go ahead and do, uh, we'll do labels last. Cliff's got the, the stuff. I, I like this one. We'll blade the ends ever so slightly and it's gonna fit right in there. All right, Cliff, I think we're ready to make final terminations, which means shutting the system down. Thank you, sir. All right, I wanna get the, the crimp is at the front end here. So you wanna make sure those conductors get all the way up there. All right, use those diagonal cutters, pinch it down. I would say not death grip, but quite snug. And then see how it's butted there and it's to the end here. That's good, good quality, what I'm looking for. All right, that one's ready to seat, but first we'll de-energize the system before we lift that grounding conductor. So the Orion Smart device has the ability to read engine off, engine on. And that's really important because the, uh, the resting voltage of the battery, the vehicle battery, not microgrid, is gonna be lower than the operating voltage, the running voltage, and it's probably gonna be like 11.4 and 13.2 or something within that range. And you don't wanna draw power from the battery when the vehicle's resting because you'll drain the battery and it won't go to start. You won't have sufficient um, capacity when you're ready to drive off because you will have drained it through the system in the form of lights and other appliances. And so the Orion Smart will shut off energy feed from the vehicle battery to the microgrid when the engine is off and it will um, open that gate, it'll close the gate, depending on whether you're an electrician or a layman, layman it will allow flow when the uh, engine turns on. It separates the batteries. It's, it's gonna it functionally isolate the batteries from the vehicle to the microgrid when the van is not running. Here's the on off. So the middle position is off what we're looking for. So one click, boom. See that thing de-energized? Now we're gonna make our wiring connections starting at the front, working our way back. All right, so we're not using our negative. I've got it capped with the wire net. It's in here, it's a spare. We're gonna label it as a spare on both ends and I'm just gonna push it down into the battery compartment so it doesn't get pinched. Positive, come around here. I'm gonna enter right through there um, based upon that uh, wiring port in the cover. I'm gonna terminate right here. So that's plenty of conductor. So that says the Orion Smart Input. And uh, we've used the Brady Label Maker to make these labels and we're um, essentially describing uh, both destination, de destination really, so it can be found. The other end can be found more 
easily and then we've got spare. All right, we're gonna open up one of these battery terminals a little bit. Be careful, <laughs> don't cross uh, negative to positive. Be an unpleasant surprise. You get a, a sizable arc and things can start to melt. Start to melt, yes sir. Okay, so that stake on is gonna slide right in there. And then what size is this? Happens to be an eight millimeter. We're gonna cinch that back down, but don't, don't do death grip. Shear it off. You'll shear it off if you death grip it. Okay, tug test, always. That's in there, put the cover back on. Okay, there it is. Double checking tools, watch out for them. This slides in towards the front. It's got some uh, clips that catch. There it is. And then large flat head, 90 degree turn. Secures those. All right, so the Victron um, Quattro is in the off position. Victron Blue Power, 10 millimeter socket here. Spin this off, get rid of that unused stay con there's both ring style as well as fork style um, and there are larger rings smaller rings larger forks smaller forks so lots of options there yellow uh, stay cons here are for 10 gauge um, they also whoo look at that they also come in um, I would have figured that wouldn't have done that but it's they also come in blue and red for smaller conductors. There it is. So, it'd be nice to do that without an arc. You, you tell me what's why that arced. Any ideas, Cliff? Why did that arc? Do that. Why did that arc when I connected the, the neutral? What do you Earlier think? Earlier or just now? Just now. <laughs> There's probably something else that's on that's utilizing that connection. Something feeding through or... That unit there that's got lights on. Yeah. I can't remember if it was Victron or, or another manufacturer that we uh, were trying to investigate a torque spec on a piece of equipment and they said, uh, we, we contacted them because you know this stuff is expensive, you don't want to shear it off, and they said, it's a nut, make it tight. We're like, what? <laughs> There's no torque spec, it's just a nut, make it tight. <laughs> Hilarious. It's like, that's electrician, electrician humor to the, to the max, it's too funny. Are we good to terminate that, uh, this positive now and torque them both down? And we're at 14.1 inch pounds. Yeah. Well, just till it's tight. Till it's tight, or till it's tight. There it is. About 5,000 clicks before these torque screwdrivers need to be recalibrated. But you can pick them up for about 45, $55 on Amazon. We really like this Nico Tools brand. It's been really reliable for us see it in this tight space but the shunt goes right here and i'm calling it a shunt i don't know if that's the right term for this particular device's function there it is boom what does it do only fits in one way it uh, continues a wiring pathway and continues or interrupts so before we put everything back together here, we're going to um, get the Victron system monitoring pulled up so we're observing what's taking place. Then we'll turn it on, make sure that we have uh, normal operation, and then we'll energize the vehicle. And that taking one step at a time is a thoughtful approach to um, kind of preventive troubleshooting. If something's not right, you know, we'll, we'll have a specific 
time or function that causes it to malfunction. And so we're, we're looking to always turn things on in a manner that gives us as much information as possible because things do malfunction and fail. Sometimes stuff is bad out of the box. Like I said, I've you know made a mistake once before. So let me know when you're ready. I think it's ready. Okay, we'll turn it on here. It picked up a little bit? Yep. And puts up 14 points. Was it like 12 point I think before? But yeah, there's not a whole lot there. Is there a power flow diagram? I don't know if that's what this is supposed to be. interesting this is last updated two days ago. I wonder if that was firmware or surely not the power flow. Well, Idle. it probably has to be uh, connected to the internet. I don't know that it. I think she just has a hot spot, so it's not. She may not have it on right now. So, uh, sump pump and ball valve. And <clears throat> they're both located. Sounds like one. You got two on right. that. Ah! That's embarrassing. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, so the inverter's still on. It's cool. <laughs> the light's working. I don't know which switch is which. Helpful to have it. AJ. So up here we have, uh, I'm gonna call it a control panel. There's all kinds of stuff going on here. There's 12, a couple of 12 volt ports. Um, we've got just flipping things willy nilly. Where are the lights? What is that? It's pretty bright. I think that's battery state of charge right there. 13.1 volts It's probably what that is. I was not intimately involved with this project until today. So figure some things out as we go. Pulling this control apartment uh, panel off. And what we're gonna do is um, try to diagnose why the electronic ball valve was not functioning and why the sump pump's not turning on. They were tested before this vehicle left the shop, um, but they're not working at this point. So let's see what all we find. Oh my goodness. Oh my golly goodness. So the ball valve is an interesting switch in that it's a um, on static, or I'm gonna say closed static open. I don't know which is which. Hmm. Okay, first things first. I'd like to turn on the lights in here so we have a little bit more light and uh, make sure things are operational. Found the light switch. That's step number one. Um, I am starting with the ball valve because I know which switch that is. Uh -huh. And so what I'm determining, he, uh, I know it's not operating right now, but what I'm determining on my end is can, I, can you bring my, my tester case so this goes in? What I'm determining on my end is whether we have power to this point. And what I'd like to do is, um, we know it's not functioning, but at some point we'll need to test power to that point. And I can pass my tester and alligator clips along. There it is. A ball valve is um, part of the discharge system. So I don't know exactly where the gray water, black water, how it's, it's managed, but the ball valve is just a gate. It's just an on off for plumbing and it's electronically controlled from this switch. So there's a set of conductors that runs down there and um, it's, a, it's a three position switch. So you've got open to allow water to discharge. You've got hold so it's not actively trying to open, it just holds its present position and you've got closed where it's actively closing. And uh, the question is, why is it not doing anything? Nada, zilch. And there is a little water in the tank if you need me 
need to empty the sink so we can have stuff running. I'm happy to do that. Okay. It won't be necessary now. We are getting the light indicating power. Um, oh, yeah, so um, the batteries. Are you able to pull up? Yeah, that and then we can kind of chase them for some specs so we can fine-tune the system. It does say that uh, it's currently charging when the vehicle is on. That's what the Orion says. So, so yeah. And we just want to get the um, discharge voltage, float voltage, all that stuff right. Did you do it? Yeah. All right, put it down all the way. You know, it's, it's jumping around. I don't understand. Oh, you know what? Silly me. Are you on continuity? No. There it is. I was on um, AC voltage. Such a resi electrician. Look at me. Okay, so I'm getting 13 here. All right, Zeke, flip it to the middle position. Now all the way up. All right, I'm going to change my probes. Just stay there. I thought you meant the ball valve was jumping around. <laughs> right, the, the voltage reading is jumping around because I had it on an AC selection. Goofy. I'm definitely not a gear junkie. No one has ever called me that. Okay, let's try that. All right, Zeke. Uh, flip it all the way up. Okay, middle position. All the way down. Uh, I got nothing that time, but no guarantee I did adequately pierced the insulation. Oh, there it is. 11.9. All right. You're all the way up or down? Yeah. All right. All right, so we're definitely getting power to the ball valve and it's definitely not responding. And so the question is, can we rehabilitate this ball valve? Like, is it just, seized up here on the end and if I pop it free will it move is it uh, it's probably a fatal flaw you know 90 95 percent chance if it's done it once it's gonna do it again and nothing's just popping loose or anything all right I'm willing to say it's the ball valve we've got power to it it's an enclosed unit it needs to be replaced and did you find those wiring connections? Okay, Adelaide, we've got power to the ball valve here and it's responding to the switch. And so uh, we'll need to get another one of these. Is this um, something you sourced online probably? Um, Nice. Okay. We'll get into the sump pump now, see what we see what we find. It'd be helpful to know where that is and then we can kind of leave it in a uh, easily accessible condition. It's all right there. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Okay. I'm just gonna keep this more or less. If you wanna pop that together, more or less just keep it from dragging everything from here back to those splices. It's gonna be replaced. Uh, let's see where that sump pump wiring comes in. It's in the same split loom, actually. That's it, isn't it, sump pump? I don't know. That is the sump pump. Does it go into there? Can you see it? Yeah, it goes in there. It goes in there? Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's just do the same exercise where we just p pierce it here and check. 
Um, what is it? Can you uh, see what it would take to dismount that sump pump, just in case we want to get into the unit? There's two wing nuts, but they're more than finger tight. Okay. Um, any idea if we loosen those wing nuts, are we going to be able to... It looks like it would just drop down. Here you go. Or drop off. Let's take a look in there. All right, Zeke, the switch next to that one. Can you flip it on? Yep. Uh, the only way it'll go. The only way that it will move is fine. And try the next switch next to that. And turn it off. And what device was that? That's either the, the water pump or the sump pump. I don't know. But if I just turn the water on, the pump goes just by itself without me having to flip the switch. Too. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. All right, let's change up our leads here. I don't know why we have three to the sump pump. Let's try. All right, Zeke, you remember the, um... oh, there we go, auto select. Oh, we're at 13, okay, yep. Yep, 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 yep. So worth looking inside the sump pump, but we've got what we need. Let me just check our switches up top. Uh, keep an eye on that battery voltage for me. Right there. Let me know if it changes down to a functional zero. No, all right, we've dropped the sump pump um, off the bottom of the the van. Oh, I like that foam pad there just to prevent rattling and banging around. It does have liquid in it so we're opening it um, cautiously and keeping it supported so it doesn't dump on us and our tools. Uh, ooh, is coming on. Let's see if there's anything serviceable about it. Uh, nope, it's... Hmm. Uh, Amarine made auto bilge pump. Hmm. It's too bad that both units would have ceased functioning. They did work at some point. Correct. We've got power to the units. I mean, the only other thing we could do is play with the uh, lead configuration. Like, pull it apart, find another power source, and see if we can just get it to, to jump on. But it has power. Yeah, and it did work, so it should be fine. So it shouldn't be a power issue. No. Reasonable to you? To my knowledge, yes. You know, if there's a lot of like sludge in there, something I would say, you know, maybe a good cleaning is in order, but uh, it's, it's not, it's a very clean interior to the container. And so, oops, mine are clipped in, but. All right, I'm gonna let you fight to get that back in place. I'm gonna put the switches back together and uh, I think the benefit in leaving it just as it is is it'll make it easier to uh, replicate the initial success we had when it were first installed oh yeah I don't know why both units would have failed but they both have power they're both right at battery voltage down there so uh, my recommendation is acquire both units um, there's a chance because we have so many Amazon hubs around here, if they're Amazon products, maybe we you know pay another 25 bucks and get same day. 
So I, I say we jump on, see if that's an option, we can still take care of it today, and otherwise we'll just schedule that return. You've got quite a drive to get down here, is that right? I mean... Always a reason to be in Indianapolis. I, I don't plan on being here at all. I'm in Indiana right now for all for this. this. I came from Washington and about to go to Phoenix. I wouldn't have come here otherwise. Wow. So I, I need it done. I don't care. Mm -hmm. when, however we need to do this. Cool. Yeah, let's see what those uh, product availability is. Thanks for joining us. Not everything turns out to be a win, but we got something accomplished and we'll bring the van back to finish replacing the sump pump and the electrical ball valve. If there's anything gritty and really neat that we figure out there, we'll make sure to post it in the comments or a follow-up video. And don't forget to subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.